Well, Hello, we're joined here with Dan, who is the VP of Architecture for Ambic. And what we'd like to talk to him today is how, what if a customer were to come to you with a typical low power proposition and they've got a problem to solve in the next 18 months, they've got lots and lots of ways that they can potentially do that. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that kind of problem? How does that work? Well, it's a good question. I mean, we have a lot of different angles to go. I would start with what is your primary problem? What are you trying to solve? What's your application? What's your end product? How are you engaging with customers? How is low power really yep. manifesting into your product value? So you have somebody that's coming to build a device that wants, let's say, a watch that wants to last for a month. Okay, but what are you doing? What is the user interface? What is it running applications? Try to break it down so that we understand the problem statement. We understand, obviously, the target application. And then we go from there. Um, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, one of which obviously is our low power silicon. Yeah. But we have fantastic software team. Uh, we have our AI team that is, is continuing to grow, that is building world-class low power applications running on the low power hardware. We have a systems team that is building uh, system board designs that allow us to have high efficiency, therefore has good power efficiency. We have um, uh, people who have actually worked in our team that have been on the other side. They've built end user products. They know the problem statements and they can interpret what the customers are trying to do and say, let me help you get to where you're trying to get. Yeah. Right. So if I was going to summarize that, uh, because what you've actually outlined there is about 20 things. Yeah. The reality is you actually know the answer to that question before they've asked it. You probably know. Yeah. yeah, you probably know the three things that actually they should be asking themselves that they probably haven't thought about. Yeah. So if we just were to take, you've covered a lot of, covered a lot of area there. Yeah. But the reality is, you know that before you've even walked in the room, there's probably three to four things that you're definitely going to be having a discussion about. Yeah. So if you had to summarize that in order, what are the primary things that customers who you need to use ultra low power? What are the three things that you know that they are going to have to be dealing with? Well, the first thing, I mean, we, we have to start with, obviously, our products are geared towards uh, things running off of batteries or very limited energy constrained environments. So first thing is, what are your constraints? Yeah. What size battery? How long are you trying to have that product last? So give me a milliamp hour type number. Yeah. Yep. And then you say, okay, now, second question is, what are your compute requirements? Are you running just a watch? Is it just a watch face with some activity counting or is it I'm running WeChat, I'm running, you know, uh, different applications. I'm trying to play, uh, I don't know the latest and greatest games. I don't play a lot of games, but you know, a lot of, uh, and you're looking at the wrong person to know the answer to that question too. So there you go. Um, so what is the user trying to do? Are they, is it a fitness type of device yep. where, you know, I want to be able to have maps. I want to be very interactive. Yeah. So what am I trying to fit within that power envelope that I'm constrained to? Yeah. And then the last thing is how can we, what can we do to enable you to cut that in half? We want, you're telling me you want 14 days of battery life. Why not 30? Why not two months? So What's you will the, challenge the customer to, to, to go beyond their absolutely. expectations. Absolutely. Right. And well, it's, it's interesting because I thought you were going to go in, a, in another direction. Okay. That's interesting. I thought what the question I was going to ask you is, do you try and cut down their expectations in order to get low power? Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, that, no, that's interesting because yeah. that, okay. So when we, when we talk about low power, there's generally two ways that you can leverage our low power. You could just do the same old thing you're doing now and do it twice as long or 10 times as long, depending on what the solution is. Or you can do 10 times more work in the same powering thing. We always try to go the, why are you not doing 10 times more of the work? Well, as a consumer, I want to challenge our customers to give me that unique value proposition. Why do I need to go to my watch and interact with it to tell you I'm going for a run? Why do you not know I'm going for a run? That's a really hard problem to detect. 
it requires a lot of compute. We don't have the compute and battery left. Aha, we can give that to you. Yeah. Next question, you know, next problem. What, what else is preventing you from being able to do 10x more work on your device? Well, we don't have the capabilities internally, algorithm development, whatever. Aha, we have internal experts that can help guide you there. We, we don't want to do it for you. We want to enable you to do it for yourselves because it's your value proposition that we're enabling. We have partners that we work with that have these algorithms. We can pair them up and say, well, you can now run this algorithm and have the same or less battery life than your existing product. Now you have 10x the value in your product. Now you can go and compete and have best in class device. And now I'm a more avid consumer of that product because now I want to be able to go buy that. That's a, that's a killer product. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we want to challenge our customers to be able to go above and beyond Yeah. because we are also customers. We want to see that in the industry, right? I want yeah. to have a watch that does all this. I want to have an on wrist, you know, assistant, coach, doctor, all of those things. I don't need a step counter. I know how many steps. I don't really care how many steps I took. My niece tell me how many steps I took, but I want to be able to just have it augment my life. How do I get this device to augment my life in better ways and it last for months on end? Right. So in terms of the 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 interaction with uh with your 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 component mm -hmm. and the power there's a software component in there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I again thought you were going to go in a different direction. So to get all of that, is there a is, your experience and knowledge of all wearables? You'll bring a whole host of experience, aren't you? Where their expectations are possible. So how does that? How does how do you share other customers' intellectual pro property and experience in order to drive that process? So the first thing I'll say is that I'm, I continue to learn. I mean, we talk to our customers and I continue to be amazed at what they're actually doing, the technology innovation. So I'm still a sponge, right? I'm bringing it in. Um, and especially with, you know, AI and the capabilities that we're starting to enable them to do on device, running these complex workloads, the innovation is just starting to flood in. I mean, these, these engineers are just waiting for, just give me the room to innovate. Yeah. So we're giving them that room and now they're starting to innovate. So we're starting to see a lot of newer use cases coming in, which therefore has different problem statements along with it. Yeah. And it's good for us. It feeds it forward to our next gen products to say, we're going to get you over the next hurdle or hurdles. Talk to me about what else you want to do. Don't talk about what you're trying to do now. Tell me what you want to do five years from now. I want to enable you to do that tomorrow. Right. Yes. And so we don't, you know, we, we absorb all of this information. We have a lot of people, as I said, we have people that work at the company that have been on that side. They know the problems. They know what they've, they're have they running up against. We use that as kind of our, our, our throttling and uh, um, our fuel to be able to go ahead of our customers and try to go, you know, down the road so that when they get there, they're not going to be blocked by, you know, problem X or problem Y. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't take information and, you know, kind of use it on customer X. And then I go to customer Y and say, well, I know how to solve your problem because I know how customer X did it. Obviously, we don't do that, but we take it in and we under we try to sort of assimilate all of that and figure out generally how do we address general processing problem statements. We know AI is a big thing. It That imposes certain restrictions on software, on hardware. We want to go out ahead of that. That's why we have people who are working on AI are going way out ahead and they're trying to pioneer and make sure that when our customers get there, they're not going to run into these problems. And so we try to really solicit information from them uh, on what they're trying to do, what they think they want to do uh, out in the future. We talk, we try to talk to um, what ends up being our customer's customer, the ones that are building services and things on top of these devices yeah. to understand what they want devices to have capabilities to do so that when our customers build those products, they get exactly what they want. Yeah. So um, just briefly, just to finish off, what you described there is a whole system. So you talked about the battery management. You talked about uh, how long that lasts. So, but then you you just quickly just mentioned, uh, you know, for want of a better phrase, the whole app world. Is that what you were describing there? How how apps are using power and their their complexity and how they sit on the device. So you have to be 
Yeah, and it's it, it's it's the applications. It's really the whole infrastructure, right? You have applications that are running, that are going back into the cloud. They have yeah. you know fitness and data crunching that's going on, so that they can provide information back to the user, or they can provide information back to the vendor, so that they can you know know how to better engage the customer and provide better value. So. You know, we have customers that do a lot of fitness applications. They have a lot of health apps that that all, you know, you, you have sleep information, yeah, you have yeah, daily activity yeah. information. They're assimilating all of this information in the background. And we want to make sure that those services that are going on, we have the right, you know, building blocks in place to enable those so that they can happen across months of, you know, battery life. Somebody doesn't have to take their watch off and charge it every night. We want them to wear it all through the night. Yeah. We want them to wear them through the day. It's just a piece of, you know, and it's an extension of clothing. It's just, you just yeah. have it on, right? Yeah. You don't even think about it. Yeah. We want to be able to get to a point where you do that perhaps with an earbud, you know, you're wearing it just, it's just all the time and you have constant hearing assist and augmentation. Yeah. And that requires very low power. It requires understanding the application and the integration with our silicon and our software to to enable that. Okay. So we're trying to go out ahead and make sure that we. So I just got one. Just got one further other question for you because it's quite interesting the 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 the, the, the things that you've covered there. Because essentially, with all of that, we've talked about technology. Mm -hmm. You've talked about our architecture. You talk about software. I would think that from everything that you've been talking about. You, a real value add that Ambit can offer is time to market too, because you're going to be saving them. They have these ideas. Mm -hmm. They know they don't be using a lot of uh, a lot of battery life. Mm -hmm. They only have so much time to bring things to market. So would it be true to say that you have a very strong value proposition in terms of all that experience and knowledge, so you can speed up their process too? Yeah, that's definitely the case, and and very true. And we see that. Both from a from a positive as well as a challenge and an opportunity. So the positive is we do allow them to get to market quicker. We're trying to pave the way so that it is easier uh, from an integration. And it comes down to simple things, just you know, the software that we give them, make it easy to use. We're solving the real hard problems so that they don't have to think about all oh, the power management, how we deal with all of the low yeah. power stuff. Yeah. Just make it seamless to use so they can port this, the the things that they already have over easily. But we give them as much time to really do the innovation, to take advantage of that headroom that we've given them. That takes time. And it's not something that they, a lot of customers necessarily have the luxury to be able to do. Yeah. They're under pressure. They got to get the products out. Yeah. So we try to help enable them and catapult them with our own internal software. So we yeah. give it as a reference. Here, just use this as a baseline. We've done all of the hard work in terms of how it interacts with our low power technology. Now, build your you know, secret sauce on top of that and go. And the other one is trying to get out ahead and work with them on kind of next, next products so that we can, by the time they actually get to the product, they've already have this collateral available yeah. and they can just unload it and go. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think, I think the reason why I asked that question was because, you know, everybody has um, their own products, their own ideas. They know that they're going to have power restraints. They know that. But what you're actually describing is a whole suite of solutions that don't necessarily just re revolve around how effective you are with the power. You're saying there's a lot of other stuff mm -hmm. that you can offer as well as, oh, I've got a very low, low, low power chip. You're describing a lot of other, if you like, backroom services, yeah. backroom support that they wouldn't naturally assume that you could offer. That's true. I mean, a lot of what we do and try to focus on has to do with really showcasing and leveraging our power efficiency. But there's also ease of use. There's um, easing the so overall software development. So it's not just about doing low power, but at the end of the day, it actually does come back to being more power efficient. If we can help guide customers to develop software in a certain way yeah. so that the result is actually more efficient. Yeah. That's a win-win because now we don't have to come back and, oh, the power is higher than I thought. And we have to look to see, well, what are they doing? Don't do this. Don't do that. Just make sure we give them the guidance so that when they build it, it's right by construction, hopefully. Um, but there is a lot of, you know, there's performance. We don't talk, and certainly I haven't talked about performance. Those, those two go hand in hand um, a lot because we have to be able to um, enable 
certain levels of performance without compromising the power efficiency. So it's about maximizing performance and you know mis- minimizing code inefficiencies or giving them hardware blocks that offload a lot of code so you don't have to write the code for it. You just enable this piece of hardware and it goes. In the background, that hardware is working to give you a 10x power efficiency benefit, but it's also a performance efficiency. So it's about building the software around making sure that that is a seamlessly integratable thing. I was going to say, it's all about integration, isn't it? Yeah. It's everything, everything, I mean, you, you, you must spend, you and your team must spend a lot of your time just and understanding the whole integration of the software, how it affects the power, yeah. how the whole system works, and then how you move that forward for future product development. Right. Yeah, you know, our team, our team generally, I mean, we call most of my team is called system architects and it's yeah. for a reason, right? We're not yeah. chip architects, it's system architects. And actually several of them are more software than hardware. And it's largely because we have, you know, the hardware maybe is the easy part. The hard part is the software. And some of my colleagues are going to chuckle because I always say it the opposite. It's software is easy, hardware is hard, but it's about the partitioning between those two domains and what makes the most sense. Yeah. Right? It, in some cases, it makes more sense to just run it all in software. And if we give them a really low power processing environment, then that's perfectly fine. In some cases, having dedicated hardware to do it is the right thing to do. So it's about that balance and constantly uh, making sure that we've put all the pieces together to enable our customers to do what they need to do. So it is a balancing act in a lot of cases. Very good. So, very good. Thank you very much for that in, in, in instruction. It sounds to me like you don't just sell low power chips. You you have a you are you sell a lot of value added architecture, value added experience, value added insight as to how they build products, not just for now for low power, but how they make sure they can be building in the future and getting them to market as quickly as they possibly can. That's right. Well said. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it.